we're going to talk a little bit about rhinos. So we're going to hand you over to our next speaker, who's a real inspiration actually, uh, Simon Jones from Albert Rhinos. And uh, so Simon will probably not share his background, but basically he spent over 20 years in the corporate sector working and then just thought, actually, I want to do more, I want to make a difference. And it's now dedicates all of its time and resource uh, to helping rhinos, the name of the charity. So uh, I'm going to hand you over. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. And thank you, everybody here, for coming out today in support of elephants and rhinos. Um, you've heard a lot of the facts, so I thought I'd try and share with you how I feel about rhinos. To do that, I'm going to tell you um, a little personal story. In 2010, I was at a game reserve in South Africa, in the Eastern Cape. And while I was there, I was lucky enough that one of their white rhinos gave birth to a calf. Gave birth to a little boy. Uh, and when that little calf was three days old, I got my first glimpse of him, as his mum brought him out into the open for the first time. Uh, it was only a glimpse, because that's a stressful time for a rhino mum, so we left her in peace. And uh, when that little calf was one week old to the day, I spent one of the most magical hours of my life sitting, watching him. Watching him play in the long grass, struggle to keep up with his mum while she grazed on the plains. And life's tough for a one week old rhino calf. Eh? He's got tiny little legs compared to his mum. He was regularly having to, uh, to take rest laying down in the grass and uh, sometimes he would sit up like a, like a little dogwood all the time with his ears twitching and turning listening out for danger like I say to this day is one of the most magical times so imagine my horror after returning home and inquiring how that little calf was doing when I was told that his mum had been killed killed by poachers now back in 2010, this rhino coaching crisis was only just starting to take hold. We didn't have the experience back then that we do now on raising rhino orphans. And without a mum, that little guy didn't survive either. And six years on, it still hurts. And I still stand here now telling you the story, really holding back the tears. But it's not an isolated incident, as we've heard. That scene is being replayed over three times every single day across the continent of Africa. It's three times every single day. And for what? For its horn on its end of its nose. And as Virginia said, it's made of nothing more than keratin. It should have absolutely zero value to anything and anybody other than a rhino. And yet, as we stand here today, it is said to be the most expensive commodity in the world. Unbelievable. Something that's the same as our hands, our uh, hands, our hair and our fingernails was fetching between $75,000 and $100,000 on the black market. It's driving around 1,000 rhinos per year over 1,000 rhinos per year to be killed. And let me tell you, that little calf I told you about, you won't ever read about him in any poaching statistics. Technically, he's not a victim of the poachers. But you tell me whether or not he would be here today if his mum hadn't been killed. In my eyes, he's as much a victim as his mum was. <laughs> So I stand here today as the CEO of Helping Rhinos and as a concerned member of the public and I make three appeals. The first appeal is to our government and to governments around the world to implement an enforceable legislation against the use of illegal wildlife products. The key word is enforceable. If we cannot persuade people to want to change their behaviour, we have to force that change. And we do that by making them afraid of the consequences of their actions. And I'm not talking about vigilantes, I'm talking about a legislation that has penalties that are routinely handed out that puts people off. We know it works, we've seen it before. 
In this country, people didn't stop going to the pub, drinking eight pints of beer and getting in their car and driving home because they woke up one morning, thought it was a bad idea, or they just didn't want to. They stopped because they were afraid of getting caught and the consequences. We can do the same for our wildlife. It's time to stop the mixed messages. Surely no more mixed messages about illegal trade in rhino horn. It won't work. No more mixed messages about whether an ivory piece is old enough for it not to matter. It does matter. And it has to end, and it has to end now. Secondly, I appeal to the people around the world who are users of rhino horn. Please stop. It is doing you no good, and it is driving rhinos to extinction. I'm encouraged by our partner in Vietnam who tell me that the next generation are showing signs of caring more about wildlife, looking differently how they use animal products in their culture. So I appeal to the youth of China and the youth of Vietnam, be that change. Be that change in your community. And be that change that prevents extinction of animals like rhino, elephant, lion, tiger, pangolin, Oh my god, we could go on and on and on. And lastly, I appeal to you, the people on the streets in London and around the world. You have a voice. Join the herd. Make a difference. Use social media. Used in the right way, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Think about the ice bucket challenge and how that invaded our lives not so long ago. Write to your local MP. Tell them that you don't wish to live in a country that has a domestic trade in endangered animal parts like rhino horn and ivory. You can help to make the difference. Today, as we heard earlier, is the start of the CITES conference in Johannesburg, and the delegates with a vote have a big responsibility on their shoulders. We have, we have put our trust in them to make the right decisions and our wildlife is relying on them to make the right choices. The world is watching. So in closing, I just want to quote Prince William from his um, keynote speech at the time for a change event last week on World Rhino Day. And he finished by saying, if we are to succeed, we must do more. We must do it better, and we must do it faster. But most importantly, we must do it together. And for me, that last bit is the key. We must do it together. This is a huge problem. We can have no more silos. No more people fighting against each other because they have different beliefs. We all have the same common goal. Individuals, charities, companies, governments. We must not, and we will not, let our wildlife down. Not on our watch. Thank you for your support.